Well, happy first day of Unleavened Bread, everyone. Ray, I guess you've got my title now. <laughs> it's no longer Minuteman Morgan. We've got Minuteman Ray. How about Ready Ray? Ready Ray. That's, that's better. Ready Ray. Good job. Good job. Well, I, I certainly hope that everyone had a very meaningful Passover on Thursday night. I know we did here, and the day, uh, the night to be much remembered, rather. Uh, we also, of course, as Ray and, and Larry said, it was just wonderful, just a very meaningful time as well for what it pictured. But today we're at the next step in the fulfillment of God's master plan. Because immediately after the Passover comes this day. As God, after God has forgiven us of our sins through Christ's sacrifice, the question comes, arises that for us is how do we continue to avoid sin since we must go on living in newness of life? How do we live as God's redeemed people? Well, brethren, we find the answers in the remarkable symbolism of the feast that we're starting today, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to notice something here in verse 15. <clears throat> verse 15, notice that when God free, freed Israel from Egypt, he tells them the following Exodus 12, 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, if we drop down to verse uh, 39 in the same chapter, he further explains the following. Verse 39, and they bake unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Now, leavening, of course, I think all of us are aware, is an agent such as yeast that causes bread dough to rise. And the leavening process takes time. The Israelites had no time to spare and they, when they left Egypt, so they baked and ate flat bread. What started out as a necessity continued for an entire week. God appropriately named this time the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as we her, as we find in Leviticus 23, or the Days of Unleavened Bread, as it's called in Acts 12.3. When Jesus came to earth as a human being, he observed this seventh-day festival, sometimes called the Feast of Passover by the, by the Jews because the Days of Unleavened Bread, of course, follow immediately after Passover, so the two adjoining festivals could seem to be as one. And in fact, Passover themes do carry over into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus observed this festival as a child, of course, and later as an adult. You, know, you can, if you want to, those accounts are in Luke chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 26. The early church, imitating the master and his religious practices, observed it as well. God gave his earliest biblical instructions concerning this festival to the Israelites as they prepared to leave Egypt. If you're still in Exodus chapter 12, look at verse 14. Verse 14. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day remove the yeast, or the leaven, from your houses, for whoever eats anything with leaven or yeast in it from the first day through the seventh day must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. 
that is all you may do. And that's from the NIV version. Um, so this was a seventh day festival, we learn here, with the first and the seventh day being annual Sabbaths or holy days. And of course this year, uh, this is a double, as Larry was pointing out, this is a double Sabbath, a high Sabbath as well as a weekly Sabbath. Each year as the Israelites observed the feast, it reminded them of God's deliverance of their forefathers from Egypt. In verse 17, the Creator instructed, Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. The exodus from Egypt remains as a foundational reason for observing the feast today. Just as God delivered ancient Israel, He delivers us, brethren, from our sins and difficulties. Notice Jesus Christ's teaching about leaven, which He which explains the meaning of the feast. During his ministry, he performed two miracles in which he fed thousands of people. After one of these incidents, when the disciples had gone around the Sea of Galilee, they forgot to bring bread with them. So Jesus told them the following in Matthew chapter 16, verse 5. Matthew 16, verse 5. It's just one line. You don't need to turn there. He says the following, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, of course, the disciples naturally thought he was talking about their lack of bread or their forgetting to bring bread. However, he was using the occasion to teach them by calling on the symbolism of leaven. Notice in chapter uh, 16 of Matthew, verse 11. Notice what he told them. Matthew 16, 11. Mm -hmm. He said, he told them, How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they got, then they got the point. They understood, it says, that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. You see, some of them, some of the religious leaders of the day taught and practiced man-made traditions that were actually contrary to God's law, and thus they were sinful. And Jesus told them in verse 6 of, uh, of Matthew 15, when he was directly confronting the, the Pharisees about this, he said, Thus you have made the commandment of God by no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. They were hypocrites because they were trying to force their versions of the law on the people, but yet they were, they were breaking God's law in essence, in truth, by their traditions. The days of unleavened bread brethren, remind us that with God's help we must remove and avoid all sin, symbolized by leaven, and live genuinely by God's commandments in all areas of our lives. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Apostle Paul taught the same spiritual lessons that the Messiah had, invoking the comparison of sin to leaven, in reprimanding the Corinthian congregations for its divisions and intolerance of sexual misconduct, Paul wrote the following. Let's look at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice what he says here. He's on the same wavelength as Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6. To the church at Corinth. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly, truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, 
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, the church at Corinth was obviously and mistakenly keeping the feast of unleavened bread. Paul makes that clear. However, Paul used the Corinthians' faithful obedience in keeping the feast physically by removing the physical leaven from their homes as a basis to encourage them to celebrate the feast with a proper understanding of its spiritual intent. Today, brethren, removing leaven from our homes for seven days reminds us that we, too, through prayer and God's help and understanding, must recognize, expel, and avoid sin. <clears throat> the Feast of Unleavened Bread is thus a time of personal reflection. Before we be able to remove sin, we have to recognize it in ourselves, do we not? So we should meditate on our attitudes and our conduct and ask God to help us recognize and overcome our shortcomings. Perhaps not all at once. <laughs> at least we be overwhelmed, some of us. I speak from personal experience. But if we do, God is faithful to show us where we need to change. Spoke, Paul spoke of this much-needed reflection, self-reflection, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. We well, want to look at there, chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Notice what he tells the Corinthians here in his second letter to the church in Corinth. He exhorts the church at Corinth, verse Five, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are indeed disqualified? Brethren, not only this time of year, but all year long, we should be examining ourselves. Measuring our conduct against the perfect standard of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Of course, we're going to see that we fall short. That's not the point. The point is to see where we need, perhaps, to be working, to be asking God to help us, to be asking Him to give us more of His Spirit to overcome where, wherever it is we see we're falling short. You see, we learn by doing. We learn spiritual lessons by doing physical things. That's why performing the task of deleavening our homes and avoid leavening for a week reminds us to vigilantly watch, watch for sin in our life, watch for sinful thoughts and actions so we can avoid them. Because God knows that despite all of our intentions, we all sin. Many years after his enlightenment on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul described the powerful human tendency to sin. Notice this in Romans chapter 7. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> many years. You have to realize the setting here. This was many years after Paul came to see the light, as it were. But in Romans chapter 7, verse 21, he says the following. He says, I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight, I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, he's saying deliverance will come through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. You see, Paul knew 
And he understood that life itself is a battle with sin. Even though he, in his inward mind, the real Paul, the Paul that was the new man, understood, but yet there was that old man still present, even as is the old man and the old woman still with us today. The Bible speaks in Hebrews chapter 12 of the sin which so easily ensnares us. And we need God's help. But brethren, make no mistake, we have our own part to play in struggling to overcome sin. We have our part to play. We must make the effort. But then we must also rely on God to help us. Because it is humanly impossible for us by ourselves to overcome. Paul explained this to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Notice what he tells them there. Philippians 2, verse 12. He said, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he wants you to work out your own salvation, but notice the following. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So brethren, what we have here is a is a partnership with God. Yes, we must do what we can, but what we can't do, we must rely on God and His Holy Spirit. Paul, indeed, brethren, did not end his discussion about struggling with sin in Romans 7 on the seemingly hopeless note of remaining enslaved to sin. He went on in chapter 8 to show that we can be free of the way of sin and death with Christ's help through God's Holy Spirit. Our observance of the days of unleavened bread helps us to realize our crucial need for the Messiah's help in overcoming our weakness. And this was reflected in the second aspect of how God commands that this feast be observed. By eating unleavened bread throughout the seven days. What is the significance of unleavened bread that we are commanded to eat? You see, notice that we're not only commanded to get the leaven out of our house, but we're commanded also to eat unleavened bread seven days. To effectively remove sin and to prevent it from regaining a foothold in our lives, we must do something. We must replace our human weaknesses and sinful tendencies with something far better. And we learn this from God's instruction to eat unleavened bread throughout this feast. And what does this unleavened bread represent? Well, our master explains himself in John 6. John 6, 4 through 13 where he, after, of course, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, or as it approached, and shortly after he performed a great miracle to, to feed thousands, notice here in John 6 what he tells the crowd that followed him, including some uh, statements we touched on in the last chapter on the Passover. Notice this. In John chapter 6, <laughs> Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. Drop down a little bit. Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He goes on to say, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, 
which I shall give for the life of the world. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Notice the different terms here, brethren, that Jesus applied to himself. The true bread from heaven. The bread from God. The bread of life. The living bread which comes down from heaven. He emphasized that this bread that God would provide would do much more than satisfy physical hunger. As he had done when he miraculously fed them. It would satisfy the much deeper spiritual hunger. Filling the spiritual vacuum that exists in every human being, in every human heart. How significant was... Now, why did he pick bread? Why bread? Why that symbol? Well, we have to, to understand that. We need to understand the significance that bread had for people of that day. You see, bread was crucial in many ways. Bread was the most important part of their diet. It was eaten virtually at every meal. It was so common that the term break bread meant to eat a meal. And the words bread and food were virtually synonymous. In fact, even in the Hebrew prayer before eating today, the translation is, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who brings forth bread from the earth. In traveling, it was common to take bread to sustain oneself. And a considerable part of a typical woman's day was occupied with grinding grain to make flour and baking bread with that flour. They just couldn't go in down and get a bag of gold medal at the, at the Publix. <laughs> you see, bread was a key part of life throughout the day. It meant everything to the people of the time. It sustained their lives. Without bread, a person went hungry or starved. We see this reflected in, in part of what's called the Lord's Prayer. We call, I like to call it the Disciples' Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. You see, bread was crucial to the people, which is why we find it mentioned more than 60 times in the Gospels. And then... The Hebrew word for bread is lechem, which we have where we get Bethlehem, house of bread, where Jesus was born. I think that's not coincidental. It's found 296 times in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, it's not the most prevalent word found from Genesis to Malachi, but it certainly doesn't take last place in popularity being found in 30 of the 39 books of the Hebrew Scriptures. Then, of course, in the New Testament, Jesus claims to be the bread of life. So what is the biblical meaning of bread? Well, the first appearance of the word bread Lechem makes it in the word of God in Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. As the Lord was explaining the consequences of the fall to Adam, he said the following in Genesis 3 19. You don't need to turn here. One verse, I'll just read it. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You see, God lets man know here, brethren, that he will live by bread until his death. It is only a temporary source of life for him. Essentially, what it is, is he eats bread only to die in the end. But we can be thankful to God that the story doesn't end there. You see, God continues his story with man through the rest of the scriptures. He picks up where he left off with this portion in the story in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Here we learn, in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, here we learn that bread isn't the only food that man is to live by. We get insight to the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, that God began telling Adam in Genesis 3. 
For Moses wrote the following in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, man shall live by two things. Bread, chlechem, and the, and the word of God. That word, bread, or lechem, is simple enough to understand. But what is this word that man shall also live by? Well, John chapter 1 dives into meaning, or mentioning rather, how in the beginning, of course, was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And in John chapter 1, he culminates in verse 14 as he states the following. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. You see, brethren, here John understands that this word this word which man lives by from Deuteronomy 8 is Jesus, the Messiah. He is the Word of God, and He became flesh. This understanding of word, flesh, and bread comes together in His testimony of, him, of Himself in John 6, 48. Let's look there. Notice this. Notice how this all comes together. His flesh, the word, and the bread. John 6, 48. I am the bread of life. Down a little further, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You see, Jesus, the Messiah, is the Word of God. He is the Word made flesh. He is the Messiah in whom we live and move and have our being, as it says in Acts chapter 7. Our answer in the end is to set up in true Hebraic fashion with this poetic play on words. You see, God knew what he was doing in, in bringing these three concepts together. So what two things do men live by? Bread and bread. Our bodies eat bread only to die, the bread of the ground. But our spirits, brethren, our spirits eat to live forever. Jesus, the Messiah, the Word of God, and the bread of life. We see then that the spiritual lesson of God's command to eat unleavened bread during the, this feast is that if we want to rid our lives of the leaven of sin and wickedness, if we want to totally eliminate that, we have to fill our lives with the unleavened bread of life, Jesus Christ. It's not enough to just empty ourselves of sin. We must have the righteousness that comes with Jesus Christ living in us. We have to take him into our lives. This means that we accept him as the final authority in our lives. It means we hunger for him as we hunger for physical food. It means we desire to learn about him so that we may become like him in every aspect of our lives. It means we study his teachings and examples so we can better follow him as a true disciple. It means we make priority, his priorities our priorities. It means taking in and living by the whole word of God. All of this is part of what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Let's look at that. Notice what he says here in Galatians 2, verse 20. 
Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This feast is certainly a time for rejoicing because he, the Son of God, freely gives us the help we need to live a life of, uh, leave a life of sin rather, and to lead a new life in Christ Jesus. Our Messiah, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins, thus enabling us to be unleavened or cleansed of sin. And he continues to help us put sin out of our lives by dwelling in us through his Holy Spirit, leading us to regular repentance and empowering us to live in obedience to God. So in conclusion, brethren, this Feast of Unleavened Bread is not just about refrain, refraining from leavened products for seven days. The law states seven days you must eat unleavened bread. And by eating unleavened bread for seven days, the Israelites were reminded of how their forefathers came out of Egypt in haste. For us, brethren, as followers of the Messiah, the feast pictures the solution to the sin problem. We are sinless only to the degree in which we put Christ into our lives. He is the source of spiritual substance. He is the bread that came down from heaven. And eternal life comes through continuously feeding on him. Christ's work as Savior and High Priest is not something we rehearse once a year at the Passover and then forget about to the following year. Christ is there in every holy day. He's there throughout the days of unleavened bread as well as the Passover. He is there to enable us to complete the process of deliverance from sin by truly becoming unleavened. And he will be there when ultimately we share that deliverance with the rest of suffering humanity. Brethren, we have an awesome understanding through the grace of Jesus Christ, to understand the beauty of these days. Let us, think on, let's, let us think on these things. Let us appreciate and let us truly be unleavened.